Oh, hey everyone. I got a pretty cool product to show you today that's a pretty insane advancement in both off-grid and civilian communications. Today we'll be taking a look at the Meshtastic system with the LilyGo Meshtastic T-Beam 1.1. And it's pretty nuts the advantage this product can give you even over like a military tier adversary. I'll show you, let's get to it. So first off, before we get too far, one of our viewers actually recommended this product, so I want to give a shout out to Caleb and say thanks for pointing us toward this awesome gear. And unlike a lot of really expensive and often straight trash radios, the Meshtastic device I'm showing you today is only about $30, and there's a lot of other Meshtastic devices you can also purchase that tie into the same Meshtastic app and use the same technology. But to understand why I'm so excited about this, we need to understand a little bit about what Meshtastic is and why it's such a big advantage over like legacy ham radios or even high-end military tier radios. Now, some of you may be familiar with legacy ham radios that your grandpa or your dad uses to tell other old men about the best way to toast bread. Seriously, if you think I'm joking, you should just tune into one of those channels one of these days. But those ham radio transmissions work by using a handheld or a receiver, and then the radio signal goes to a repeater, which broadcasts that lower power signal over a longer distance. So the user can communicate with a longer range with the repeater, but the user, user A, has to be within range of the repeater in order to be able to hear someone right next to them. And this is what makes mobile comms so difficult as you'd have to have some big ass repeater just following you around everywhere. And I'm sure nobody would notice that. You could solve this problem by speaking in simplex, which just means that anyone on the channel you specify can hear you if they're within line of sight range and listening in on that specific frequency. But any third party outside of your transmit range, user C, may only hear the responses from user B as they aren't in the range of user A's transmission at all. And it really causes all sorts of mess. And one of the internet gear companies that I often share my disdain for commented on one of their live chats on how stupid it was for civilians to want to even use radio setups due to how easy it is to jam their signals or to simply fox hunt and find their location. And that's because the ham radio wavelength that most folks use is the two meter, 144 megahertz to 148 megahertz, or 70 centimeter, 430 to 440 megahertz. So it's very easy for military or well-equipped tactical Instagrammers to jam those frequencies across a large area. And as we showed, by jamming a single repeater, all those in range then have broken comms with one another. And yes, there are many more frequencies and some folks may try to like sound fancy by talking about tri-band, which is like one and a quarter meter, but not many people use that frequency. And in reality, the less people that use a frequency, the easier it is to find you using a technique called fox hunting. And ham radio users actually play games all the time where they do fox hunting or they have competitions to see who's the fastest at finding a transmission's location. And to do this, the user takes measurements of a signal at various positions and then triangulates the position of the transmission or just follows the increased power level. And they can do this even if that transmission is completely encrypted. So as annoying as it is to admit, those Instagram live warriors are right. It's very easy to fox on a repeater if you want to jam transmissions or just find its location. Or as maybe far more likely, use that location for a concentrated military strike. Making it extremely challenging for a civilian force to have any sort of functional radio solution. But these guys are probably army, so any network that requires a device that does more than just like press button to jam it's probably gonna to be too complicated for them to circumvent. So the Meshtastic technology takes this entire ham idea and spins it on its head so that every receiver is also basically its own repeater. Kind of, it's a little fancier, but I'll explain. 
In the same scenario as before, if each node was using Mesh-tastic, every node becomes its own transmitter and then speaks to every other node. So if user A makes a transmission, user B both receives the message and communicates it to all other nodes, allowing user C to hear messages from both parties. So then each Mesh-tastic device becomes a new node that expands the entire network. And these guys are so small, it would be really easy to connect them up to like a solar charging system. And then like hide this in a waterproof container and then paint the whole thing to just look like a rock. And there are some cool videos on how to do exactly that. And I'll put a link up here to some of those videos if you wanna put that setup together. And by making it inconspicuous, this allows you to place all sorts of mesh-tastic nodes within your operational area. By doing this, a single break in the node makes no impact to the rest of the network. Each of the nodes also communicates to one another using AES-256 encryption. That's fancy nerd talk for, yeah, you're not gonna crack that. So what about jamming and fox hunting that our <laughs> lupine adversaries may use? Well, for one, jamming becomes particularly problematic for them because you have so many nodes in the system that act as their own repeater. Blocking one area really doesn't do much when the entire network is still speaking to one another. Additionally, you as the network owner would quickly see which nodes were out and could easily identify the jammer's location without doing any recon at all. Wait, <laughs> so we don't need our chest rigs then? This places the network owner at a significant advantage in terms of area or battlefield control if the opponent attempts to use jamming devices. When then looking at fox hunting, there comes a much, much bigger problem for the attacking force. The Mesh-tastic node operates at 915 megahertz. And you may say, oh, 915 megahertz, so what? That's the same as my phone uses. And yeah, that's exactly the point and why it's so good for you and such a problem for them. The 915 megahertz spectrum is a spectrum of radio signals that is carved out by the FCC for civilian use. And it's just loaded with all sorts of signal noise. These devices are probably all over your house and you may not be aware of them. More than likely you have some sort of utility meter that communicates wirelessly to some sort of reading device. And hell, if you have a smart anything, it's probably communicating somewhere on 915 megahertz. So if we take the same fox hunting game in this situation, it basically becomes impossible. There are so many signals coming from so many directions that you can't ever pinpoint the location of a single node. And if they did spend forever and actually found one, it wouldn't actually break the network at all, and it only cost you like 30 bucks to replace it. So it's both cheap and takes away any advantages that a more trained or more well-equipped adversary may have over you. And S2 Underground actually did a bunch of really cool videos on how to integrate Mesh-tastic into ATAC and some other uses for it. And I'll link to that video up here because they tell you some really cool stuff if you just wanna see more of what Mesh-tastic can do as a whole. S2 Underground just does a really good job of breaking it all down. But tell you what, let's go into a little more detail of the Mesh-tastic system I have and look over the Lilygo Mesh-tastic T-Beam 1.1. Now, when you first receive your Lilygo T-Beam, you're gonna receive the circuit board, some connectors, and the screen. And depending on your kit, you may also get an antenna too, but yes, you have to solder it all together. It's a great skill to have, and it's not difficult. Even if you do a crappy job like me, it'll still work fine. The circuit board itself has a location for an antenna, the three different buttons to operate the device, a USB charging and data port, along with a place to put in the 18650 rechargeable battery. The battery is rarely included in most of the kits, and I think I ordered like a five pack of battery with some crappy flashlight off Amazon. Don't, don't use that flashlight, I just threw it away. The three buttons on the bottom also control how the device operates. The buttons are fairly clear on what they do with the power button on the left that turns the device completely off and then the function button in the center that allows you to move through the various menus and displays and the last button on the right that you can use to reset the device if it's doing something wonky. 
and there are some other bits on the board that some of you may savvy folks may recognize, but for most of you, it just doesn't really matter. I'll tell you what though, let's go and put it all together and I'm gonna show you how to connect everything up. And here you can see how I snapped off the pins besides the four I needed, and then soldered it all together in the correct location. Here you can see the correct positioning. I soldered the bottom in location first, then attached the screen and soldered in the remaining leads on the LED screen. And if you're scared of this step, there's actually some soldering trainers you can get off Amazon with like some radio soldering kits that then you can practice and tinker with and then go actually do your mesh-tastic devices when you're all perfect and mastered in your soldering skills. You can also find some much better antennas that give your T-beams a ton more range while also being able to move the antenna in a 90 degree position. And I'll share one more video. Ham Radio Prep actually did a really cool video showing the actual range of these different devices using some of these upgraded antennas. And I'll link to that up here if you wanna check that out also. All right, so next you install your 18650 battery. And here's the proper battery orientation. This absolutely takes a good bit of jamming. So don't be surprised if it feels like you're doing something wrong. All right, so having just this is extremely problematic. It's fragile, not very waterproof, and the whole thing looks like it just wants to electrocute me. So you can also 3D print some LilyGo T-beam cases over at Thingiverse using the supplied models on the website. And I wanna say big thanks to PAD Ralph for helping me print out a whole bunch of these ghost cases. And to install these, you may have to move the location of some bits depending on who supplied your device, but just mess with it so you can slide the entire device into the case and slap on the cover. The whole system can then be easily set on a desk and now our improved antenna gives a much better overall solution. And I teased this product a little bit in our GBRS belt setup video, but Grim Hunter Tactical actually makes a low rise pouch that is designed specifically to fit the LilyGo T-beam. And that low rise tool pouch allows the T-beam to be enclosed in a pouch that can be easily connected in via Molly to a carrier or a belt system. And then if you're just a regular civilian who's not out there causing trouble, you could just throw this in a pack and you could use it if you're hiking or you're camping and then bring like one more node for like a base camp and then each individual could have one of these so that you all could communicate even when you're in a no comms or off grid situation. Or if things went a little sideways and you had to cause some trouble, you could connect these into every member of your team's plate carrier or belt setup so they add additional communication nodes to the entire network system. And this small SMA connector on the mesh device would even allow you to connect in whatever antenna setup you may be using onto your carrier for additional distance. And then even in an entire calm out situation, those members on the team who have those mesh-tastic devices on their carrier can still stay in communication. And all of that, regardless of if you have an adversary who's using electronic countermeasures, or if you're in a remote location that has no comms whatsoever. All right, so you're probably all dying on how to set all this up, but I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a ton of really good videos, particularly from Ham Radio Prep, and I'm gonna link to those up here because they have a lot of really good information that I'm probably just gonna rehash. I'll go over the basics, but I highly recommend you look at their videos for the entire concept and how to do it from beginning to end. The Mesh-tastic device works by first downloading the Mesh-tastic app from the App Store. This app is what is used to receive and transmit SMS messages to the entire Mesh-tastic network. Once downloaded, pick one of the nodes that would be yours and pair that node to your phone via Bluetooth. And I already know I'm gonna get some wizard who's gonna say that Bluetooth isn't secure at all and it's the weak point of the entire system. And yes, Bluetooth is certainly the weak point in the Mesh-tastic communication chain. But the same fart sniffers that are saying that civilians shouldn't use radios are using Bluetooth for their PTTs, so take that for what it's worth. Inside the app, you can also change the network name and reconfigure the network that your node is operating on. And when you receive your T-Beam or any other mesh-tastic device, they're all gonna come on a default channel, so you need to change the channel that each node is on if you wanna secure your communications. And here it starts to get a little bit tricky because you have to connect your phone into each node and then configure that node specifically to connect into the rest of the network. And no, you can't just like name them all the same thing. 
the network needs all the encryption keys. So you use the little QR code when you make the network and then configure all of the nodes using the same encryption and keys with the QR code. I just took a screenshot of the QR code and then I printed it out so I could set up each node using my phone. It's more a complicated concept and it's really actually not that hard to actually do. Then, if you're all configured and set up properly, turn on all of your mesh devices and send out a test message. Here, you'll be able to see the message on each of the devices to make sure they're all communicating. And you can actually press that little middle button, the function button, to cycle through the menus and make sure they're all on the same network and that they see one another. But that's the gist of it, and once you have it all set up, the sky's really the limit on what you can do with these. From just getting a small kit for hunting and camping, a few for your family in an emergency situation, or even making your own elaborate covert design to build that low cost SMS comm network to outfit your property, your neighborhood, or even your entire city. And I'll make sure to put all the links in the description for all the videos that I referenced so you can make sure to go back and learn more about all the cool things this meshtastic device can actually do. Like the ATAC integration that S2 Underground goes over, that's pretty awesome. Well, I hope this video on mesh-tastic devices was helpful in your purchasing decisions. I think they're pretty awesome. But I wanna say thanks to all of our Patreon supporters and all of our YouTube members. You guys are awesome and you make all of this possible. I also wanna say thanks to everyone else that likes, comments, and subscribes. Comment down below what you think about mesh-tastic devices. All right, everyone, Walsh out. It's like the 30th airplane. Oh, weird, an airplane. What the heck? I think my cat chewed on this.